Go ahead. All right, all right. So um, basically, as I've said, we have uh, five different classes. So this is just a description of the whole data set and then the number of images we have in each of the folder. So these statistical features we are actually extracted in the past before uh, CNN. So people were kind of uh, using some kind of statistical approaches to be able to like extract this uh, uh, information from those images. Remember, when you have an image, it's being translated into what? values ranging between zero and one. So you can be able to compute some kind of statistical values and then use it to be able to what, make your own prediction. So the information that we are extracted, we are more of like the, the channels, the right, the red, the green, the blue, the correlation, the energy, that's for every image, the contrast, the homogeneity, and the level for every image. So every image has a level, either it is bees, ant, grasshopper, weevil, or beast. So this is the code we would like to extract that, but I wouldn't go through this particular code. The most important thing is the concept. So I'm moving into the aspect of, so what basically I did here is to be able to like extract this information and then save it in a CSV file. And that CSV file is what is known as what, the insert features. Then how do we implement artificial neural networks? So you all learned from Dr. Ba as of yesterday about uh, neural networks and then how can we be able to like implement it? So first of all, you need to be able to know the kind of uh, uh, transformation or the kind of things you really want to like carry out as such that will inform you on the kind of libraries you will require. So the first thing is what the problem uh, statement or the definition, you need to understand the problem you're actually trying to like carry out. Is it a regression problem or a classification problem? If it's a classification problem, what kind of algorithm do you really intend to like use? And what are some of the things do you really think you will need in order for you to have a better performance? So as such, we'll be using the Keras library, as I said. So Keras is a wrapper of what TensorFlow. So from Keras, we have what we call the sequential. From Keras model, we have what we call sequential. So when you are using the Keras model, you have to be very, very careful with how you import Keras. Because remember, Keras depends on TensorFlow. So if you are importing, you have to be very, very careful with how you import. And then you will know how to use all of these uh, uh, methods since we are in object oriented. So these are the most important aspects of what we actually need because we are going to implement an artificial neural network. So Keras has a model called the sequential. When we say sequential, we are going to stack all of these layers of what you learned yesterday. We have the input layer, the hidden layers, and we have the output layer. So now the data we have is in a tabular form. And this data was extracted from all of these images of this uh, particular uh, insect that we want to actually classify. The second thing we need to do is be able to like make our data available. So we have to import the data set, which is in form of a CSV. And this is the structure of the data. This is just the image. And then these are some of the numerical information, statistical information, which we've extracted from these images. And this is the level. So this is what we call a dependent variable, the level or the outcome variable. And this is what we call the what? The independent variables or the explanatory variables or the predictors. So the idea is, can we be able to develop a model that maps each of these dependent variable to this what? Uh, this independent variable to this dependent variable. So that is a whole idea. So there are several approaches you could actually go to solve this problem. We have the classical machine learning where you could actually use random forest, or random forest decision tree SG boost, all of these things. However, we are going to go through the route of what artificial neural networks. Most of the times, the data you have is not really in good shape. So you need to be able to what, put it in good shape in a form that is suitable for you to use in your model. Most of these models have a specific uh, specifications for the nature of data they expect. So you have to pre-process pre this data in such a way that it suits that particular what, that particular assumption that that particular model actually makes. So during the extraction of this, most of the features, I have images, right? That have been class, uh, I have five different types of images for what, for insects. We have bees, ants, grasshopper, weevil, or bees. So this could be images of diseases for a particular crop, right? So the whole idea is I want to see how can I be able to like develop a model that can be able to learn the pattern in this uh, uh, insect. And whenever I give it an, image of this insect, it should be able to like tell me, this is this insect, this is this insect, with a very, very high accuracy. 
When you look at the nature of the data, we can say that it's a little bit balanced, 50-50, right? Because we have almost equal number of images for some. So the idea is, I want to introduce to you a different approach so that we can be able to use artificial neural networks based on what you've learned yesterday before we move into the convolutional neural networks. So I use an approach in, uh, known as uh, the grayscale uh, co-occurrence matrix called GLSM to be able to extract some of these features from the images. Remember that image is seen in computer has what numbers ranges between zero and what 255 as we've talked about in the computer vision aspect. Now, if I'm able to load this image in a matrix form, which has values, certainly I can be able to extract certain values or statistical values from this. And that's what basically I did. So I was able to extract some of these statistical values from each of the image and then converted everything into a CSV file. So this is the code to do that. And what I have right now is what is being loaded as the CSV file has insert features. At the end of the day, for every image, this is the image name, I extracted the whole values for the red channel, the green channel, and the blue channel. Remember, these images are what? They are color images. So that's why I'm able to separate each of these channels. And then compute the correlation for each of these images, the energy, the contrast, the homogeneity, and the level. So for every image you pick, that image is coming from a particular level. It could be bees, it could be what? Weevil, and this is the level. So now, the nature in which this uh, data set comes is, Sometimes the data type might be totally different. And most algorithms uh, require that the data should be in a correct format or in a word, good format in order for you to be able to like use that particular algorithm. So as such, I have to be able to like convert each of these uh, values into what numeric. And this is what I did here. Then I needed to know the distribution of what the level, right? The level is also known as what the outcome, the dependent variable. And then these are all the independent variable. So it means these values, I'm looking for a function that can be able to like map all of this independent variable to this level, right? So this is a mapping, but how can I be able to like get that function? So that's what we're actually going to learn. So the first is to be able to like drop this because we don't need the image name and then we don't need the level during the training. So we have to be able to like split our data. So I converted split this data into two parts, right? I removed the label and then call it what the explanatory variables. And then I have the label one side. But then this is in what in categories. Our model do not require this to be in categories. So I should be able to like convert it into a different form. So I will use the label encoder to be able to encode this. For example, I could say bees could be zero, weevil one, and then the other ones two, three, up to the total number of classes we have. And that was what was done in here to convert everything. Then I can't just train a model on your whole data set. I need to keep part of the data set to be able to like evaluate to see the amount of error that my model has made. Just like when you are writing exams in school, your teacher will teach you and then give you some exercises with the solution. However, during your final exams, your teacher will keep the answer and then give you questions without the answer. It's left for the teacher to receive this result of what you've written and then be able to like compare with the marking scheme and then give you a final work performance. That's what we are doing here. We are splitting our data set into training and testing. And then we're announcing that the test percentage to be what 20%. This is the test size. This has if you have 100, 20 are going to be used for what's testing. And the random state simply means that whenever I run this code, the same number of of uh uh Distribution of what the number of classes for those in the training and the testing should be equal. It shouldn't change. Why? Because you may run this code. We don't have the random state and you run this code. The performance you may have will be different when you run it again. We are trying to avoid that. So we are doing that for reproducibility. Then the next is when you look at these values, they are really, really large. While these other ones are zero. So if we don't scale these numerical features, into almost the same scale, we are going to have a problem. So the algorithm will pay more attention to features that have what higher values as compared to the one that have lower value. As such, we are going to like standardize it. When we standardize it, that simply means that we are going to have a mean of zero with a standard deviation of one of all the values. So all of the value will last between what, zero and one. Now, yesterday you had the opportunity to, can you see this diagram? 
it, we can see it. All right. So yesterday, I'm very sure Dr. Ba explained the whole concept of the neural network. So I just want to reiterate a little bit and then be able to like relate it and map it one by one so that each and every one of us will understand. Now, I'm sure during his explanation, he made mention of the fact that you have your input layer and you have your hidden layer and you have your output layer. These are the three major layers we have in what in a neural networks, basically artificial neural networks. Now, this is the input layer. It is called the input layer because it has an interface or it interfaces with what with the data that we have. And this is the hidden layer one, hidden layer two, and this is the output layer. Now, the hidden layers, it depends on what and the kind of problem you are solving. It's advisable you start with what? Small number of hidden layers, like two, minimum of like two, three, or four. Why? Such that you should be able to like learn all of these patterns in the data. But the input layer, what does this simply mean? The input layer, this is the initial of our data set. This is the initial of the data set. How can we be able to like input this into the whole network? First, we need to stack the first layer. So the first layer is the input layer and it interfaces with what? With the first hidden layer. Now, this arrows you are seeing is what? It's telling us that this neurons you are seeing here has to do with the number of columns. So in the input layer, we are, we are going to specify the size of the input layer. It should be equal to the number of columns of what you have, right? Then for the hidden layer, all of these are going to be initialized. So this is what we call the neurons, right? So when we talk about the depth of a neural network, what we are really talking about is what? We're talking about the number of what? The number of layers, right? The number of layers of this particular neural network. But when we talk about the width, or when we talk about the height of that particular neural network, it has to do with the maximum number of neurons for all the layers. You realize here had what? Five neurons. Here we have what? We have seven neurons, right? So we have to say what? The depth is what? It's of seven. Then the output layer, this output layer is dependent on the kind of problem you are solving. For our own problem, we are trying to like classify what? Five different what? Five different insects. So as such, the number of neurons here depicts the what? The total number of what? The output. If we were doing a binary classification, either this is an insect or this is not an insect, we are going to have one neuron here. Why? Because we are going to have a probability that it is in a, the positive class. So, and then we have a threshold. So at this particular point in time, for a binary classification, we are going to have only one neuron here. But for a regression problem, you will also have only one neuron because you are predicting a numerical value. However, there are times whereby you might be doing, dealing with multi-output regression problems. That is to say, you want to be able to predict more than one output. As such, the number of neurons you have here should be equal to the number of output that you have in your work, your regression problem. Now, since we are using Keras, we are going to be using the sequential word, the sequential approach. Sequential simply means that we are going to stack this network based on what the layers we have. We have the input layer. Then first, what we have here is what the object instantiation. So in Keras, basically everything we see in Python is called an object. So what we are doing here is we are trying to instantiate this particular object sequential. We're now saying that all of the properties of what we have in this particular class should be assigned to this. So you could see this has a blueprint, right? So all of these classes are like blueprint. When an architect gives you a design of a particular house, you can give that design to any other person to use. So the first person could be, say, let's say Fred. You could actually name this Fred and then with the kind of design he has. So any other person could be able to like instantiate this. Once you instantiate this, you now have what a blueprint of that particular house. So the next is, first of all, let's look at the input, right? We need to what? We need to add a particular dense layer. So for the first input, we need to what? We need to add what we call the dense layer. This 64 is the number of neurons we have at the first input layer. But now, how do we know the number of what? The number of neurons we have at the first input layer? It becomes x train dot shape of one. Remember, when we take the shape of a data frame for a two dimensional data frame, the first what the first tuple is the number of rows, and the what the second is the number of columns. Remember, indexing starts from zero, right? So zero is the number of rows, and one is the number of columns. Why not saying that we are expecting an input dimension of what the shape of this, which is going to be what 
seven because we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So basically it will be replaced with what seven here, an activation function of lady. So we spoke about the fact that we need an activation function and that activation function is nonlinear. So why do we need an activation function here? Remember what we have here is what? These are the neurons, right? And all of these neurons are initialized and they are also what we known as the weight. So this is the knowledge. This is what we are trying to learn. We've initialized this, but then when you look at how this is being computed, you take the values of this, multiply this, you multiply this, you multiply, and sum everything with the number of neurons that gives you here. However, what we are doing is an element matrix multiplication, right? At the end of the day, you are going to have a dot product of what? Of vectors. So when you look at a linear combination of this linear function is still linear, and that will not be able to like capture the nonlinear as such, we need a non-linear activation function. The next is this, what? The second hidden layer. Now, one thing you need to know is the first hidden layer and the second hidden layer, they are all together. That's why you may not really see it here. But then the first hidden layer and the second hidden layer are all together. Why? Because the first hidden layer and the input, they are all interfaced together. So all is actually being captured here. So it means that we are initializing the first hidden layer with what 64 neurons it means the number of neurons we have are going to be 64. for the second layer we now stack at another layer with neurons of 32 and activation function of what 64 which is the same value and then for the fourth one we had what we added another hidden layer has it has 16 neurons and the activation function of what really then for the last layer which is the dense layer which is equal to the number of classes remember we're dealing with a multi-class classification problem. As such, the number of classes are five, and then it replaces it with five. Why? Because of the output layer, and this is the output layer. And we use this softmax uh, activation function because we are dealing with a multi-class classification problem, and it's always advisable that as you start small, the, no the activation function that should be used at this particular point in time should be softmax. You can use uh, sigmoid here because of the what the output of the sigmoid function so it output just probability which lies between zero and one so that is a bad choice here so the choice of the, the activation function actually matters then let's look at the nature of what the nature of the network that we all have here so we can say the model dot summary you see sequential of 10 dense layer 64 and you can see you realize that we just added 64 but we don't see the input layer so we have one two three and where is the fourth one and the fourth one is the output layer but now how do we get the total number of parameters in here how do we come about the total number of parameters remember that when you have your input which is the number of columns that you come here and you've initialized with what 64 you can be able to approximate or guess to know that the total number of parameters is going to be the input times 64 then plus 64 because at the end of the day you are going to have the bias. So the bias should be added to what? The total number of neurons. If the total number of neurons here is 100, you're going to add, multiply 100 times the input, the size of the input, then plus 100. And that's why we have 500 and what's So 64 times 7 plus 64 will give you this. Then the same output we have here. So each of these neurons is connected to the next one. And at the end of the day, we are going to have our output layer. And that's what we have in here. And when you look at the total parameters, they are what? 3,205. And this is what we're actually trying to learn. And the trainable parameters are what? 3,025. Yes, because we are all going to learn all of those parameters. Then we could actually look at the layers to see each of the layer and see how are these weights initialized, right? The knowledge we are trying to learn are the weights and the biases. So we want to see how are they being initialized because if you don't include the input size, there is no way to be able to like initialize the width. As such, we can be able to like get all those information that we need. So we can pick the first hidden layer, which was what I did here. Look at the shape. We have 64 by 32. What does it mean? It means that the shape here was 64 and the 32 is what? The 32 is the number of what? The number of output that we are expecting for that particular layer. And that's how we got this 32. But how about the biases? So these are the biases. 
but then even for the weight you can actually check the weight by removing this and just typing the weight it will give you the output of that particular weight that was initialized during the training the next stage is for us to be able to like compile our network so you stack all of your network and you have your distance as a model which was what we have in here the next stage is what we can be able to like compile now during the lectures, I'm very sure you heard about the optimization uh, approach. So we have what we call the stochastic gradient descent. So once you initialize this weight and you're able to make predictions, you need to be able to like compare, to put a measure to find out the differences between your predicted value and the outcome. What is, this, what is the behavior? What is the error? Can you be able to like measure the error? Yes, for this, when we are dealing with a regression problem, we have what we call the mean square error that helps you to measure the amount of error your model is making. So as such, we should be able to like tweak those weights. And in order for us to tweak that weight, we need a particular approach, which is what we call the optimization approach. So we use what we call the stochastic gradient descent. So there are several other uh, optimization algorithms you could actually use. We have the gradient descent, we have the ADAM, we have the RMSP prop, and all of those things. So for this, we are going to use the stochastic gradient descent, then the loss, the loss function, or call the cost function. Basically, this is a function that helps us to estimate the amount of error the model is making based on the prediction. And then the metric we want to actually use to evaluate this model is what we call the accuracy. And we're using the accuracy because we are actually dealing with more than one classes. And also, considering the fact that the data set is almost balanced, so there is no biasness in the distribution of the data. So accuracy will also be a good metric for that. But assuming you are dealing with a binary classification and the distribution is not and the data set is not evenly distributed, so accuracy may not be a good metric for you to use. Why? Because if one class is it, is it is eighty percent, and the other class is twenty percent, so the model will see more of the eighty percent, and it will tend to learn more of the information the eighty percent has compared to the what the twenty percent, and assuming you have such kind of a model and the model predicted. Uh, negative for the all you realize that you have an accuracy of 80 however that model does not really perform well the next is to be able to like fit and in the fit uh, and in fitting this model basically we need to pass our training and what our training data which is what the whole uh, predict predictors and also the level and this epoch is the number of times we want the whole data set to pass through the whole network the whole architecture how many times do we want this data set to pass through the training data set to pass through this particular network, both the what, the forward propagation and the back propagation. And this batch size of 16 simply means that we want to separate, uh, split our images or our data into what, 16 batches, such that the computation shouldn't be that much at, or shouldn't be that much at once. So the whole idea is we are going to break down the whole data set we have into 16 batches. The first batch would go, the second batch would go, the third batch. So the total number of batches we have is what we call an iteration. So when you divide the total number of what the total number of data set you have with the total number of batches, that will give you the number of epoch you have. And then the total number of uh the number of times the whole data set passes through the network is what we call the epoch. And you realize that this is the training, and with the training, we have been lost. So this is the error the model is actually making. And this is the accuracy. However, remember these are all images, and we are trying to like extract. We extracted this. We handcrafted these features to be able to see if we can be able to develop a model that can be able to like classify all of these insects. So, you could actually increase the what the number of epochs you have, or reduce them in order for you to have something useful. Any questions so far? I'll just unmute and then you can talk to him. Okay. No questions. You have any questions? Is no the concept questions. clear? Okay. You can go ahead. Uh, Jeremiah, right. you might, we're recording the session, so you might want to maybe show your face so that we can see you or... Um, yeah, there you go. Yeah. In case you want to post it online as well, yeah. All right. So um, next is we actually want to see how well our model is performing. So 
we were able to like uh, make our what do the training. So training, the learning process is the process of trying to like update to look for the best parameter. And each of these parameter is a representation of or is a knowledge of what we are trying to like gain. So as such, we want to be able to like plot to see how well is our model learning. So we are going to plot the number of epoch and then the loss, likewise the number of epoch and then the accuracy. So for this first plot, we could see that we configured it to have what 500 epochs, and then this is the loss. So loss is the error our network is actually making. You realize that when we move from left to right, when the epoch is at zero, we had a loss of 1.6, right? For the training loss, this is the training loss. We realize that the more the whole data set passes through the network, the better our model becomes somehow, considering the fact that the loss keeps reducing. And we hope that this loss should get close to zero. However, when we look at the validation loss, instead of the validation loss to actually decrease, it's actually increasing. That gives us more information that our world, our model is overfitting on the data. Look at the gap. You could see the gap. This is the what the loss for what the training loss, and this is what the testing, uh, the training. This is the validation loss, and this is what the training loss. We expect that the training loss and the validation loss should be a little bit closer. And with this, we can say that our model is what overfitting. All right. So even when we stop our model from, even when we use 50 epoch, it's okay because of the fact that the model is overfitting. Secondly, the accuracy. Since the model is overfitting, we don't expect to have a very high accuracy because of the fact that the model is actually overfitting. And you can see that the accuracy here for the training, the accuracy of the training actually starts from 0 0.2. It increases up to what? 0 0.6 something. But look at the what? The validation accuracy. We realize it's even stuck at 0 0.4. That gives us more information. The gap between this and that of the uh, training accuracy, that gives us more information that our model is actually overfitting. Then when you want to make prediction, you can make prediction, and then we have a particular uh, method known as a confusion matrix that we can be able to like plot to see where is our model making a mistake and where is it actually doing well. So the confusion matrix is a matrix that gives us more information on how well our world model is performing. And when you look at the, along the rows is what is the true level. That simply means that the actual level is what we have along the rows and along the columns is what we want the predicted levels. This simply means that the intersection of this row and this column tells us that these images or based on this data, it is, it is an, they are actually ants and our model was able to predict that are ants. How many times? That's 1% of the time. For the bees, it was actually bees and yes, the model predicted that it was bees. How many of it? 40 times. So when you look along the diagonals, this is what we call the true positive that it is actually a B and your model was able to predict that it is a B. Of the diagonals are the errors that the model was making. Here, this, uh, this was information that it was actually a beta, but our model predicted that it was incorrectly, that it was what they were at 18 times. So this is just a confusion matrix that gives you more information about the uh, model you just developed. And uh, we could see that this particular model is not really performing well. There are a lot of things that could be done in order for you to improve this performance. So now, as I said, we have what we call the hyperparameters and we have the model parameters. The model parameters are basically the what, the weight and biases that we initialize. We don't have control over those particular parameters, but the hyperparameters are things we have control over. For example, the optimization algorithm. We use stochastic gradient descent. Someone can choose to use other. You see, all of these are what they are called hyperparameters. Likewise, what? Likewise, the number of neurons to use in each of the hidden layer. All of these are hyperparameters. So it means that we have control over those parameters. But for the uh, models parameter, we don't have control over it. It's the algorithm that learns to what generate all of those parameters. So these are this is just an an exercise for you to look into what we've employed, uh, we've uh, built, and then to see how you can be able to like extend it. So you can increase the number of hidden layers, change the number of neurons. So you don't have to do something very big. Based on what we have, you can just tweak it. And I've given more information on what you could actually do and reasons why we're actually doing that for this particular session. So this is the end of the artificial neural networks. 
Is there any question before we move into convolutional neural networks? So for the artificial neural networks, for his, uh, you realize that the data was in the tabular form. We extracted those information from the images, okay? Any question? All right, so for the CNN, I'll just move, I'm going to look at a different concept. I'll add up a different concept, what we don't have transfer learning, and then we'll see how that actually goes. So the first and the most important thing is so the libraries of interest, which is what I actually declared here, then set up directories. All of these are things you could actually change yourself. And then now I need to be able to like set the input size, just like what we did with the artificial neural network, and then the batch size, which is what I did here. Then pre-processing. I need to be able to like pre-process more of like a data augmentation. So it's a way of trying to like increase the size of the data, assuming you don't have enough data. The idea is you want to see how you can be able to like out of the images you have, is there a way you can tweak it to create several images? For example, you could rotate your image by a certain angle, and then that could be an extra image. You could increase the contrast, or you could kind of reduce a particular color to see how you can be able to like do that. Or you could flip your image horizontally. All of this is a way of trying to see how you can be able to increase what the size of the image is. It's what we call the data augmentation. So we have this specific approach. When you are dealing with a tabular data called smooth, that is synthetic minority over sampling technique, whereby the minority of the class, you tend to increase the total number of observations for that particular class. However, when you are doing that, you have to be very careful with the evaluation metric you are going to use. So there are several ways or approaches you could go about evaluating that. So this is able to give us the total number of classes we have. Likewise, for the validation, this gives you the total number of what images we have for the validation, 240. But then we need to build this network. <clears throat> we're also going to use the sequential. So there are three different ways you could actually build a model with Keras. So remember, I spoke about that the way you import your, your libraries will determine the way you are going to like use them. This is how I imported this. From TensorFlow, the Keras import layers. And from TensorFlow, import Keras. But you see how I'm able to like use them inside, a little bit different from what we had. There I instantiated, I just called sequential and then open bracket, I uh, added, stack my layers all together. But here I called keras.sequential. This gives us more information that this method, also known as a function, but in object oriented is called a method. Is what is from this particular word class. So we have the sequential then, when you look at the convolutional running class, for example, we talked about having three major layers, the convolutional layer, the pooling layer, and then what? The fully connected layer. The first is what? To add the first layer. The first layer is the curve to the, means the convolutional what? Two-dimensional layer. We're now saying that instead of neurons now, we are dealing with what? Canals. We are dealing with filters. Filters are basically the information we want to extract from this image. When you have an image of a human being, for example, you could set one filter to detect the ear, one filter to detect the nose, each of these, but you don't actually know the maximum number of filters that is required to be able to extract this information from these particular images. So you randomly assign this value. And then this three by three simply tells us that the size of the canal, remember, we have an image, we have a canal, or we have an image, we have a filter. So the size of that canal that we are going to convert or we are going to swap to this particular image is what we're actually assigning here. Then the activation function, as we've talked about before, is going to be really, then the input size, you need to be able to tell this network that the size of the images we are expecting is of this particular size, right? And then this three is the channel. Remember, we are dealing with a color image. Because of that, we are expecting three channels. So you need to tell the network that, oh, Based on this architecture or this network, we're expecting three channels. So treat it what with caution. Then the next, we are going to start the max pooling. After extracting these features, we are going to have 32 word filters, right? We're going to have 32 filters or 32 word, 32 canals. Then we are going to reduce the size using what? Two by two word, two by two canal. The next is we stack another word, stack another layer, convolutional layer. So these convolutional layers actually extract this information or these features from these images. So when you look at this particular layer, basically they learn low level features. When I say low level features, these are features that we can't really see with our eyes. But basically the computer understands itself. 
And these features could be what? Could be the lines, it could be the edges, it could be the contours of a particular image, right? So as you move from these layers downward, the features that are being extracted, the knowledge that the network is getting begin to increase or improve from lines, you now start seeing edges, you cannot start seeing the image, oh, this is the loss. But then for you to start seeing that, that comes through toward the end of what the upper layer. At the upper layer, you now start becoming a full image of what you actually pass through the network. So the first layers actually learn the low level features and toward the ending or the output layer, what we have are the high level features that you could actually see to say, oh, this is a human being, this is not a human being. But from the beginning of the uh, of the network, you don't have much information. These are low level features. In the end, we are going to start the dense layer. But before then, remember, we have a max pooling layer and all of these are what in two dimensional. So we should be able to like flatten all of this to become one part, one long array, and then feed it into the fully connected layer. And this is where the fully connected layer comes in, also known as that, uh, the artificial neural networks. And we now stack this particular layer and then the total number of classes. Why? Because for the output layer, we need to specify the total number of classes and then the activation function to be softmax. So why? Because we're dealing with what? A multi-class classification problem. The next is, let's see the architecture of the model we've actually deployed or developed. You could see that the first um, uh, computational layer, this is what we have, and this is what we defined. These are the parameters. And you can be able to like calculate to see the parameters. The max pooling do not have parameters. Why? Because in the max pooling, we are not initializing anything. All we are doing, we are trying to reduce the size of the images or the size of the feature maps. So the output of the convolution of the or convolving the image of uh, the kernel on the image is what we call the feature maps. Good. So for the next convolutional layer, we'll have these particular one parameters. You realize that the parameters keep increasing, right? And certain layers would have zero parameters. Why? Because there's no computation that's actually being carried out there. And we're not really learning anything from that particular. And then flatten the, uh, well, at the flatten layer, basically what we do is we flatten all of the feature maps we have to become one long array. And then at the dense layer, this is what we actually have. You realize that we have a total parameter of what? Four million. 829,126. You see, these are the parameters we are trying to learn. And all of these are the kernels, right? That we actually, and this is the knowledge that is actually being gained. The next is to be able to like compile or uh, to compile our network. So we are using the uh, stochastic gradient descent optimizer with what the categorical cross entropy. Why? Because we are dealing with more than two classes. So assuming we are dealing with just two classes, it would become binary word cross entropy. And then the metric is going to be the accuracy. Then I now define the epoch to be what 50. Then my generators, the epoch, and everything pass in the data and it begins to trend. So you realize that with the convolution neural network, for example, we had, uh, let's see the performance. So when you plot the loss and the what accuracy, you could see that for only 50 epoch, we realize that the loss started this way and it was actually reducing up to one point something. Well, it's a little bit okay, but not too okay. Why? Because we could see that there's overfitting. The validation loss is this, and then the training loss is here. So you could see that this model is actually overfitting. Likewise, the, what's the accuracy. The training accuracy is here, and then the testing, what uh, the validation accuracy is here, which is not uh, really okay. But then let's look at another approach of what we call transfer learning. Transfer learning is a paradigm whereby the knowledge you use in what in doing a particular task, you transfer you transfer that knowledge into doing a similar task. For example, this is an app, this is an image. Let me see how I can be able to uh, explain the concept. Remember, with the first task, we develop a deep neural networks, and we had our input layer, our hidden layer, after the output layer. However, when you are dealing with images, the information that's actually been learned, the pattern that has been learned from this uh, first hidden, second, third, the beginning layers are the same in almost every problem you are solving because these are low level features that these images learn. Why do you have to redo or retrain or relearn exactly almost the same thing when you can actually transfer this knowledge 
and use it in solving a particular problem. So the whole idea of transfer learning is the weight of this particular layer, because for every image, the first, first aspect is to learn the, what, the lines, the contours, the, what, the shape and other stuff. But as you move toward the output uh, layer, you realize that it becomes the reality that this is actually what we are learning and this is where the image begins to surface and you can be able to like identify that this is a cat and this is a dog. But the whole idea is the knowledge that's actually been learned from the few hidden layers can actually be reused in solving another problem. So transfer learning is a paradigm of what adopting this approach using the weight or the kernel that's actually been used in this particular area into an existing into a new domain or into a new problem. So this is the concept. What we do is we fix this weight. Remember, this weight for convolution neural networks is what we call the kernels. We fix them without updating them during back propagation. And then we add the what? Add the output layer based on the number of classes we actually, uh, the number of, uh, based on the problem we're trying to solve. For our own case, we are going to add an output layer with what? With five neurons, right? Which is the fully connected layer. And then we freeze this particular width and then we return from what? The trainable width based on the fully connected layer we've added. As such, these features that are actually been learned will actually serve as a very important word uh, in this uh, last aspect. And this actually helps in increasing the training time and also having a better performance. But we are going to see one that is actually being done. So there are several uh, network or architecture that could actually be used. We have the VGG16, right? We have the RASNet, we have VGG16, we have the ResNet, we have the DNet, all of those things. And then you need to like load your pre-trained model. We say the weight is equal to ImageNet. So this ImageNet is a very large data set of what natural images that was actually being learned. And then we say that for every layer, trainable equal to force. What we are saying that we want to freeze all of these layers we're not going to use the weight. We want to freeze everything. And that's what this part actually does. Then we we'll try to see the trainable layers we have here. 14 million, 700, the non-trainable, they are 14 million, 714,688. And then we said that we're not training any layer from what we just transferred into our new network. And here we define a function that takes the output layer which we've extracted here with the pre-trained model and then add stack the other layers we have, which is the number of classes for the output layer and then the softmax matrix. And then this is the whole architecture of what we have in here. And based on that, we're able to like train to see that you could see that the number of total, the total parameters have actually increased. And then the trainable layers parameter is this. And then the non-trainable parameter is what is this. So that simply tells us that Based on what we've just done, not all of the parameters are going to be updated during the back propagation approach, right? So only a few of the parameters, and that actually comes in from what? The fully connected layer that will just stack during uh, stacking of these new particular layers. And then we'll fit our own training data. Now let's observe to see the performance of using this transfer learning approach as uh, <clears throat> in comp uh, comparing it with what the other approach, which we actually design what our architecture from scratch and that would be our baseline model yes so for this we use exactly the same number of epoch epoch simply means the total number of times all of these images passes through the network and you can see that from the first instance we had a validation accuracy of 0 0.5 which is even more better than what we had at the initial uh, uh um baseline implementation in the end you could see this the training loss is this, it was actually decreasing and then the validation loss is this. But you realize that there's a spike, there's a hike in here. This could be, there's a possibility that at that particular point that, that size, the batch size of those images could be maybe need pre-processing in order for this to be okay. Or there are different things we could actually do in here. Then when we compare the performance of this uh, transfer line, which is VGG16, specifically with the accuracy, we realize that for the accuracy, at least it's a little bit better as compared to what we had. We had almost up to like a 0 0.8 accuracy for this particular problem for transfer learning, which is far better than what we had from the baseline approach. So there are several things that could actually be done in order for the performance of this thing to be increased. So um, one other thing you could actually do is to 
kind of add some kind of uh, regularization technique, which could actually help to improve the performance of these models. So what I did in here to kind of uh, put down certain things that you could actually do, you could increase the number of, uh, of layers, this should be convolutional layers, or reduce them, add some kind of uh, drop out layer to see if you can be able to like improve the performance of these models. For example, you could change the size of what the filters, the size of what the canal that you've used. So all of these are things you could actually carry out to see if you could actually improve on the performance of this uh, particular network. Yeah, that leads us to the end of the convolutional neural networks. Any question? Any questions, guys? Uh -huh. Can you conclude, uh, conclude up this year? Can I talk? Yes, please. Yeah. So how do you determine the number of, um, the optimal number of epochs? All right. So, um, so that is also a hyper parameter on its own because you can't tell the maximum number of epoch that you should actually use. So more, most of the time it is trial and error, but then there is a way a rule of thumb we could actually use to help you to know the total number of epoch. For example, assuming I continue training and you realize that this last year for the last year for the training is actually down and then the validation loss is up, you could see that here it is diverging, meaning that when you stop at 49, for example, there are high chances that you're not losing anything. So with that, you can be able to tell that, oh, I don't have to set epoch up to like 100, considering the fact that after 49, the what the loss begin to what uh, the model begin to like that much, like the model is no more training, the weight are no more updating. As such, you can stop at 49. Then in your next training, you can set your epoch to be 49. Is that okay? Okay. All right. Thank you. That's okay. Um, Mr. Jeremiah, one question from me. Okay. Yes. So in uh, I see you're using Keras to build a classification model, right? Yes. Uh, so in terms of the learning rate, how okay. do you, how do you define or specify the learning rate? I know by default in Keras the learning rate is zero point zero zero one, right? One. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. So if you want wanted to change that, will there be a need to change that? Yeah, there will be a need to change that. So uh, remember the learning rate is a hyperparameter, right? Hello? Yes, I can hear you, yes. Yeah, so the learning rate is a hyperparameter. So most of the times, if you really want to like change, you could do what we call a scheduling learning rate, like mm -hmm. a scheduling. So what that actually does is, for the first training, uh, uh, for the first 10 epoch, for example, it will use 0 0.001, for example. When it realizes that the network is actually turning well and learning, it begins to decrease or increase the learning rate because the learning rate plays an important role in the optimization aspect of it. So that will actually be changed for the learning rate. You can use okay. a scheduled learning rate, yeah. Right, thank you, uh, Jeremiah. Any further questions? Any further questions? No, I think that's it, uh, Jeremiah, from us here. Thank All you right. so much. Yeah, thank you very much. We appreciate the time spent. Thank you very much. Uh, I think Dr. Va wants to say something before you leave us. Okay, okay. All right, thank you. Yes, no, I was just going to say thank you, Jeremiah, again. Thank you on behalf of everybody. Um,